Hey guys, it's Ollie from Rad Season. I'm honored to be joined today by the CEO and founder of Arbor Collective, Bob Carlson. Bob, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Ollie. It's good to be here. Good stuff. Whereabouts are you at the moment, Bob? You're over in Venice, aren't you? Yeah, I'm at my my home office in Venice. Um, LA is under a stay-at-home order, so uh, all of us are working from home. Thank you, okay. COVID. Yeah, and what's the what's the situation been like um, I'm over there where, where you guys are? Uh, it's been up and down. Um, people, we had a pretty good summer. Um, mm -hmm. People were out and about, living a lot of outdoor stuff, which is good. It's been good for business. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have turned to skating uh, as a way of staying sane when a lot of activities and things you can do during the day are shut down. People yeah. are frankly out skating more than ever before. Yeah, and 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 surfing as well, I guess, right? I mean, that's yeah, kind of... all, you know, I think bikes, surfboards, skateboards, everything's going great because yeah. it's something you can turn to that's naturally socially distant, um, and and just you know those turns keep you sane. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. That's that's what we're seeing over here in Europe. I mean, I was um, I'm in Portugal, and it's been yeah. It, I went for a surf earlier. It's been it's been pumping, and it's just it's just good to kind of clear. Clear the head, right, and get out, and you know. I mean, they tried. They tried to surf down last spring, um, and it was, uh, you know, it was pretty shocking. They chased some poor guy out of the lineup in Malibu, um, who was out paddleboarding or stand up doing SUP, and um, you know, I, 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 I just can't imagine that we, that would have lasted. Um, but it looked like it was going that way early on when people didn't know how bad this thing was going to be. But at this point, I mean, out, getting outside, hiking, surfing, skating, snowboarding, um, in my opinion, is totally safe. And uh, uh, I, I can't say enough about how it's keeping us all sane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'd love to take it back to the beginning of, of how of how you got into action sports, because because you, 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 you were growing up in, in California. Is that right? Yeah, I, uh, I'm personally, I, I grew up at a, in a pretty unique place. I grew up in the Santa Monica Canyon in the seventies. Uh, the Canyon was a real surf community back then, um, before Malibu opened up, which was I believe the early fifties, believe it or not, PCH didn't go through Malibu and it was private land and surfing in LA. There was a couple of different spots and, and state beach right in front of the Santa Monica Canyon was one of them. So in the seventies, it was still a pretty cool scene. And, um, you know, there are a lot of legends that come out of that, that zone, like Mickey Munoz and a few others. So I grew up, you know, just as sort of the, the, the short board thing started happening, mm -hmm. big single fin zone, um, lots of, just lots of legendary characters and bright colors and, and just a sort of a romantic classic era of surf. And, I think that affected me a lot. Um, and then I was, I was there when I started skating right when the Dogtown Z boys thing was happening. Um, and uh, I had the great fortune of seeing those guys skate. Um, you know, they were 10 years older than me. Um, but when I was learning to skate, uh, they were super influential on in everything we were doing. And, We'd go to Kenner and Paul Revere, and on a couple of occasions, I was there when Jay Adams was skating, when Tony Alva was skating, um, and uh, um, I, that absolutely changed the course of my life. You know, when you see those pictures of those guys skating at the schools, there's a lot of little kids in the background, and I was one of those groms just sitting in awe watching, you know, my heroes skate, and I think. I really think those, you know, growing up in the canyon and being sort of on the periphery of what happened then, just as a grom, not as a pro skater, uh, really influenced the direction of my life and um, and what I wanted to do with my free time. And um, back then, I didn't know that I would end up starting a snowboard and skate brand, but uh, it certainly was deep in my sort of my being when it came to what I what I cared about and what I wanted to pursue. So. Um, I ended up from there going to the University of Colorado, uh, really because I wanted to start snowboarding. And when I got there, I 
I picked up my first snowboard and that was 1988 and I've been snowboarding ever since. Um, I, uh, I'd say that I, again, another life changing moment, the, you know, the first time you can really tackle a 3000 foot frozen wave, um, and you know, and then get back on the lift and do it again. Uh, it is, it's again, life altering. And it was for me, I absolutely fell head over heels in in love with snowboarding, barely graduated because when it was winter, I was having a hard time getting to class, but I made it and I uh, got through. Um, and you know, those were, those are the foundations of, of my personal snowboarding, skating and surfing. Yeah. And, and, and then after university, did, were you, were you traveling then or like, like what was the kind of, yeah, I, um, you know, I just want to snowboard, like, you know, I've, I've had, I've had such a good time in Colorado. You kind of want to keep that. Keep well, that I was going to spend the rest of my life in Colorado. Uh, I was never, I was never going to leave the Rockies. Um, but I, uh, I decided that I had, you know, I needed to go see the world. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I saved some money and I went backpacking around Asia and the, and the Pacific, um, for a year with a couple of good friends, um, nice. and spent a year just slumming it all over Asia, uh, hiking in Nepal, through Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, um, and other places in and around that zone. Um, and, you know, just, just took a break from the, from the world. And be, before what I assumed was, you know, getting a boring job and earning money so I could go and surf and skate when and where I wanted, um, yeah, came home, came through LA to see my folks and was on my way back to Colorado. And I ran into a high school friend, a guy named Chris Jensen. And Chris was, um, who passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. Chris was a, a, a very unique individual, super charming. Um, you know, the guy was from the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed, he was on an adventure. He was one of those guys that you wanted in your life because you knew there was always fun surrounding him. There was always good times. Um, and he and I had been... Uh, you know, it spent a lot of good times together in our early days. And, you know, of course we hooked up while I was home and he started telling me about what he was, um, what he was up to. And I kind of suspected that he was, he was getting at something. turns out he had started dating this girl in, in Hawaii. Uh, he was over there on a surf trip and her dad, um, had this huge piece of land on Haleakala, uh, the Haleakala crater or the Haleakala volcano on Maui that he was actually working to restore. Um, and, uh, it, the reason why he owned the land is a, is a longer story, but, um, he, he had a friend who worked for the, the state of Hawaii who was into forestry and was helping him kind of restore this land sort of in the, with the idea that one day they would donate it to the Haleakala National Forest. Um, island ecosystems are super fragile. Uh, in, introduced plants and animals wreak, wreak havoc on the ecosystem of islands. And that's mm -hmm. what's happening in Hawaii. In, in, pigs, goats, cattle, uh, plants that were introduced for somebody's garden have all taken over the koa forest there and devastated their ability to renew themselves. So he was in there removing unindigenous plants and animals, putting up fences and planting koa trees. And to fund it, he was selling the dead, the lumber from the dead, standing dead or windfall koa trees. He was actually oh, helicopter man. lumbering them out one at a time so no roads would be built. And he was selling the wood locally. Koa is this um, kind of legendary wood in the world of craftsmanship, furniture manufacturers, guitar manufacturers, just artisans of of all stripes love Hawaiian koa, um, but it's endangered and it's rare. And so he was, he was seeing that there was a, a, a revenue stream there that could help his family, but more importantly, help him with this project of trying to get this forest restored. And, you know, he's a local boy. He didn't know anything about selling products on the mainland. So he turned to Chris, you know, this, this recent grad, who knew nothing about wood and said, Hey, why don't you sell the koa for me over on the main Island? Um, and build a little business out of it. 
By the time I showed up, Chris had actually gone and gotten his first batch of sustainable co logs and, you know, had no idea what was the next step. So, uh, I, you know, he, he starts talking to me, but he's like, look, we go to Hawaii three or four times a year. We can surf. We can hang out in Hawaii. We help with the harvest. It's in helicopters up in the jungle and we'll sell this wood and it'll be great. And I was like, sign me up. Let's do it. <laughs> so I totally waylaid me. I never made it back to Colorado to live. Um, it took me a year to actually go get my stuff. And we started selling sustainable wood. We built this little business called Coalition and we were selling sustainable wood products to the wood wood products industry. Um, and I wouldn't say that we completely failed, but let's just say we learned a lot of hard lessons. Um, yeah. Nobody was ready for sustainability in 92, 93. Nobody in the wood products industry, this is pre-FSC, pre-anything. And you know, a bunch of old guys were just like, you want me to pay what for COA? Um, sustain a what? <laughs> Just we got we got so many no's, and we we ended up figuring out that we had to actually take the product down the product life cycle a little bit more. Um, we had to make stuff out of it so that we could kind of catch up and be competitively priced. So the first thing we did was stop selling lumber or, or logs. We started selling veneers. The veneer is thinly sliced sheets of wood. It's actually a great way to really stretch a valuable resource. And we started selling some veneers and that started working. And we started selling some veneer products like door skins, panels. Um, and then we started making stuff out of veneers. We started selling moldings, picture frame moldings back to Hawaii, construction moldings. And we had a little line of furniture. And bit by bit, we started convincing people that sustainability was important um, and that uh, we, and we got to a point where we could actually take this resource and compete with the non-sustainable products. And I think, I think that's before we started Arbor, those, those were huge lessons. How do you, how do you make sustainability work? Uh, mm -hmm. Especially when it's not a thing today, it's a thing. It's almost, you have to do it. Um, but back then nobody was focused on it at all. Frankly, nobody cared. Frankly, a lot of people were laughing at us when we started Arbor, but back then, what, what would it take? And it really, you had to be the performance and quality had to be the same as everything else out there, if not better. Um, it had to be priced the same. You couldn't ask people to pay more for a sustainable product. Um, it had to be priced as well. And the story around it had to be as well presented and well told as anything else out there. And we started doing that with those first COA products. And we learned some hard lessons about competitiveness, sustainable business, giving back. Um, and when we founded Arbor, all of that, those mistakes and that learning were, were there at the beginning. And I think it helped us um, not make remake some of those those mistakes, at least around sustainable business um, and what it takes to get people to give it a look. And, and what was the, what was the light bulb moment where you guys thought, OK, you know, we could we could actually make. A snowboard out of this and you know we should we should try and i mean we were we still should try a prototype and give it a go right it, it's interesting we were still kids i mean we were in our early 20s um i uh i um it's an interesting time we we're working so we couldn't chase every swell every storm um yeah which is what we would do earlier in life we had this we were slowing you know we, we had to focus a little bit on business. I don't think we were focusing enough. Um, when I look back, we were jamming to Mexico and up to Mammoth or Big Bear a lot to ride and surf. But um, we, you know, we, life changes a bit when you have to make a living and pay rent, um, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, the priorities change. So we were as interested in, in snowboarding and surfing as much as, as before, but we went when we could go, not necessarily when the, it was, you know, when there was the best swell or the mm -hmm. deep snow. Um, so we, when you, when, when you're going up just to, you know, ride the groomers, you don't rush, you slow down a little bit. And, and I, I remember we started enjoying those trips to Mammoth more, you know, stopping at some cool old saloon in the springtime. We, we'd, uh, with our friends, we'd usually camp on the way up 
um, go check out a hot spring or a hike or something cool. We made the whole trip into more of the, the, the whole trip became the, the, the trip. Um, we were road tripping and, and I remember on those trips, we started talking about why there isn't something, why isn't there wood top sheets? Why isn't there a conversation about sustainability in snowboarding? Why is everything so, you gotta realize in the nineties skate and, and snowboarding, especially snowboarding was so focused on 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, that, and, and it, it's, snowboarding was at that time getting older. There were people in their twenties, thirties, forties, starting to ride or who had been riding for a while. And everything that they could buy was oriented towards the values, sort of the tastes uh, of, of teenagers. So, we're like, it would be so great to make beautiful, really highly crafted wood top snowboards um, and skateboards for that matter, and start telling people about sustainability. We know there's a customer out there that's thinking about it. Um, why isn't it happening? So, you know, Chris was, Chris was the dreamer. I was the bit of the doer. Um, and we had worked so hard to get the, the, the things we were doing going. And I kept saying, dude, I'm, I'm maxed. I can't do any more. And he go, he kept pushing me on it and I wanted to do it, but I didn't know if I had the bandwidth. And so I said to him, go make one board, figure out how to make one freaking snowboard. And then if you could do that, I'm in. And lo and behold, he went to this little teeny snowboard production facility called Yama, Yama snowboards, Michael Lish. Um, and he got one board made. And I'll never forget the day he walked in to the office and held it up. I still have it. I knew my life was never going to be the same. Frankly, we we were not within a year. Everything else that we had done up to that point, all the other products were done and gone and forgotten. So that was probably 1994. We spent a year cut prototyping the boards. Uh, we, we ultimately opened up our own facility and started making the boards, which was good because we made them ourselves. We, we learned how to do it. Um, you know, we, when we launched our, our, the snowboards, we, we, it wasn't just the wood tops, sustainably, sustainably sourced wood tops. Uh, it was sustainable, you know, all farm grown poplar cores and a reduced use of plastic. We, we figured out how to make the boards without a plastic top sheet. So we were, we were doing a lot really to try to not just offer the, that wood look, be the first to do that, but be the first to think about the whole product. And we were able to do all that because we got deep into the production of it and learned a lot of lessons. And it's funny because we had made picture frame moldings because we had wrapped veneers around compound curves. We knew how to get a, a veneer wrapped around a cap sidewall. Um, we knew that we had to put a fleece backer on it if we wanted it to, to bond well. Um, in those days, if you were making a wide sheet veneer, you paper backed it, but paperback paper doesn't let the resin push into the wood grain. Uh, it's not permeable. So we talked these fleece suppliers for the first time into offering a fleece that was 13 inches wide so we could make top sheets. And we learned how to build the boards where resin pushed into the wood and pushed all the moisture and air out of the wood grain and replaced it with resin. Now today we use bio resin and waterproof the wood. When you cut the board out, uh, those wood grains are actually hollow straws. That's how they pull water up through the tree into the leaves. And we had to figure out how to, you know, even though the everything around the wood was waterproof, we had to figure out how to plug those holes. And we learned how to figure out how to do that. And, you know, I, at some point I remember our attorney saying, you guys could do a utility patent on all this. And I, and, and we were so idealistic and I'm proud of this, that we were like, no, we, we hope that people start to replace man-made toxic fibers with natural organic fibers that provide, um, a reduced footprint on the environment. And so we didn't patent it. And, and today, you know, when I look around at all the com competition using bamboo and wood top sheets, uh, I know they're using fleece backer and I know they're using the same penetrating resins. And I know they're using those techniques that we created in the mid nineties, just so that we could get out on the marketplace with our, our wood top sustainable snowboards. The cool thing was that first board, when Chris walked in the door, I flexed it and it was way too stiff. And at first we were like, what, why is this thing so stiff? 
And it was because the wood fiber became a third layer of fiberglass in the board. It became a third composite layer. It worked yeah. with resin, just like a fiberglass or a carbon fiber works with resin to create a composite. Wood fiber and bamboo fiber work with resin in the same way. So we actually were able to lighten the boards and offer a stronger, lighter, more responsive board um, that was completely sustainable and had the beauty and one of a kind look of wood as we launched in 95. And when you guys launch like that first year, I mean, like, like was the launch was, was that going to a trade show or yeah. what did you guys, I should send you the picture of our first trade show of three, three boards in a little teeny booth in uh, late 95 in NorCal. Um, and then by March we had gone, we went to the big national SIA trade show in Vegas uh, we had we had walked the SIA trade show in nine early March of ninety five, um, and brought our some uh, our prototype board out with us, uh, and it's a cool thing because I to the almost every day every year that I've gone for twenty five years I see those two kids walking around with a board that they've made that's going to change snowboarding and I and I you know I just I pull for them because uh, I've been that kid and. You know, walking through the trade show, hoping somebody will recognize that you've got something cool, showing it to anybody who wants to look. That was us. And we, I'll never forget, we walked, we, we got up, you know, we must have left at like four in the morning to get to the show. We snuck in the trade show uh, and we walked around all day. And 95, um, you know, there were still skiers, ski business was walking around in suits and all the snowboarders were just partying. Have <laughs> off the rocker, and Chris and I were like, we are home. This is our tribe, and we wanted to be, we wanted to be part of it. Like you couldn't imagine. We left the show at the end of the day after having time of our lives and talking to a ton of people, meeting a ton of people, telling them about what we were doing. Just confident that we were, you know, we were on the right track, and you know, we had we had come with the golden idea, which you know, we learned a lot of hard lessons after that. Um, we, when we got home, I don't think I, we got home till two in the morning. Um, and that, you know, that led to the following year when we had our first trade show at that uh, for, first booth at that big trade show, um, which uh, is another pretty funny story. We actually, you know, we were outsiders. Neither of us were pro riders. Neither of us had worked at a retail store or had been a rep. We were just snowboarders, and um, we really didn't know what was cool. We, you know, we, we knew what we thought was cool, but we were not part of the industry. So we we missed a lot of the cultural cues. We came in, we made this big tree booth. We took a log off the beach, um, had paper mache these rented branches over it. I even think we had jungle noises in there, trying to replicate a little piece of Hawaiian koa forest. Um, and we got out there and we talked about, we were talking, again, we we're talking about sustainability and the benefits of natural fibers and natural materials and wood top sheets. And everybody else is talking about their rock star athletes, their, their big graphics, their baggy pants, their fashion statements. And I, years later, like one of the, my friends from the industry who was buying for Milo sports at the time, Benny Pellegrino was just like, you guys were like aliens. He was so outside the box. Um, and I didn't know what to make of it. I knew you had something, but I didn't get it at all. It was like aliens had landed in the middle of snowboarding. And I think, you know, I mean, it was, you don't, you don't take chances if you know all the problems you're going to have. It, and we fell in every pitfall. We made every mistake. Um, we may never have done it. I mean, there were 300 snowboard brands at that point in snowboarding, 300 brands. Wow. Nobody should have been starting another brand at that point. And um, it's cool. It, frankly, it was, we were, we were so different that we were able to cut through the mustard and cut through the noise in the mid nineties. But by the end of the 90s and early 2000s, as the industry had consolidated down to around 20, 15 brands, yeah. you know, we were making the cut. And but we were stopping, you know, when a shop could carry 20 brands, we were making the cut. Um, but when a shop started carrying five, six brands, we weren't always making the cut. And we had some pretty tough times and had to had to really reflect and figure out how to make our story resonate inside snowboarding and inside skateboarding. Um, and what did you like with all the consolidation going on in the late nineties? What did you guys do when you were sort of looking at this going, well, you know, you seen brands dropping and we, know, we honestly, tough times, right? it was tough times. I, I lost, I watched good friends, people I'd gotten to know 
lose their businesses. You know, a lot of them had brought in finance, you know, private equity, different types of, of finance, people who had a different idea about profitability and where the brand should go and what, what was important. Um, in many cases that led to the brand getting off track and going away. Often the, just the money wasn't there. So people just closed up the shop and they didn't have control to stop them. Um, some people just went out of business because they're, you know, they weren't selling enough product. I watched this huge cast of characters go away. Um, it, it is, and it was, it was shocking, frankly. And, uh, and we felt it, we felt the pressures. And there were times when we thought maybe we're going to have to close the door. You know, we were getting more and more in debt. We were building too much inventory. We had too much inventory that wasn't selling well enough. Growth had slowed um, to a crawl. And we, you know, we had some tough conversations. And I ended up stopping, you know, my 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 day to day because I was so nose to the grindstone, um, completely immersed in Arbor. And I pulled away and I kind of wrote a, and I still have it. I, I wrote this sort of self-reflecting report on Arbor and, and realized, you know, we had just been too outside the box. We had never built bridges to our, our, our retailers, our retail partners. We had never, you know, we, we thought that we could build this story around product. Uh, we had team writers, but they really reflected our, what our, our end consumers. So I'll let me step back. We launched, with four, with twin tips, freestyle boards in that, that show in 95. Um, but by three months later, by March of 96, we already had a line of directional boards because the market was saying, you guys need to make free ride boards. This look and feel is much more big mountain, much more free ride, much more back country. And it happened that Chris and I were starting to explore the back country, starting to learn about riding bigger mountains and getting in the back country. Um, at that time we were doing a lot of snowshoeing into uh, into accessible lines. And so we added free ride boards to the mix directionals. And that's what really sold. That's what took off for us. We never stopped making twin tips, but that's what took off for us through the nineties. Um, and the team riders, God bless them that we, we hired were big, you know, extreme snowboarding, big mountain, first descent, first descent, you know, back country guys, um, at a time, when the guys that s sat between us and our customer could care less about that part of snowboarding. Mm -hmm. It was all about what was happening in the parks and in streets and in the streets and freestyle snowboarding. And the culture of snowboarding was dominated by the culture of freestyle snowboarding. And every shop kid on every shop floor was interested in that and that alone. And we had done nothing to reach out to that kid with our story and build any bridges. And those kids were highly influential in the, in the buy and what was being bought. Yeah. So, we, I, I realized that, you know, we need to be part of snowboarding. We need to not be such outs, outsiders. We, we need to, I need to get myself out of the way. We need to start bringing in, building a management team built from people from snowboarding that, that are sensitive to at what's, what is happening in the culture. And we need to actually, it turns out we need athletes more than brands that were built around athletes. We actually need athletes so that this outside of the box thing that's so different than everything else in snowboarding um, could be understood by people that were following stories or learning about aspects of snowboarding through those personalities. We actually also reached out to artists, artists that both artists and athletes that were very interested in, in sustainability um, to help us bring color and imagery and blend that with the wood to broaden our our product line, but yet still keep it within the, the guardrails of sustainability and craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. And we ended up, you know, we started by hiring a couple of kids out of shops. As we started growing again, we brought a, uh, some people out of media and we, we ended up building our first snowboard team uh, that was more endemic. And we ended up kind of turning the pyramid upside down. We, we elevated the youngest people in the customer we el in our in our business we elevated our team riders we brought everybody to the table and we turned ourselves from arbor into the arbor collective and that's that's really the see the idea behind the arbor collective is it is a group of people that share the the brand the responsibilities and the rewards of running this business and we learned to listen we learned to to bring 
our, our athletes to the table, our artists to the table, our employees to the table to make our story, our mission around sustainability much more relevant to our partners at retail who then made it much more relevant for our end, our end customers. And we broadened what we did dramatically and we saved the brand and we turned the brand around completely. And that first snowboard team was made up of guys like Mike Bassich, uh, Rob Kingwell, um, Morgan LaFont. And those are people I learned so much about, um, about, you know, the inside of snowboarding. Whereas we had, mm -hmm. we've been so happy just to sail around the outside. Um, and, uh, you know, Pat Bridges recently was telling me, you guys, you know, you guys used, the, you know, the outside to work your way to the inside. That was not the plan. And it was a nice compliment. <laughs> it was, just, oh shit, we got to survive. What are we doing wrong? And it, it's really tough to get to a place um, where you have to admit that you don't know everything. And, you know, for me, that was, you know, around 2001. And I had, to, I had, I'd made a lot of mistakes and made a lot of mistakes in how we tell our story, how we present the brand, um, how we present our products, our story, our core values were right. We were right on point. And, um, but how we were bringing people to that story was wrong. And, mm -hmm. So that was a, a big turnaround um, and it changed the brand and um, it led us to, frankly, to the to, to survive and to grow and to thrive and to get where we are today. And and were those were those team riders um, on so so snow skate side and then the yep. artists, were they sort of I mean, they were they bought in, were they sort of then involved w w with the management side of things as well? Or were they speaking to management and then, you know, this whole collective and, and the community was kind of what so, was kind of growing out of it? So Chris and I are Gen X, right? You would have you would have thought that Gen X would have been really embrace environmentalism, but it was it it really wasn't until millennials started creeping into the market that our message really took off. And those younger employees, those younger team riders, um, those you know, the artists that we were working with, they really came from a different generation, a generation that had completely embraced the planet and protecting the planet. And we're, we're, we're much more aware of what was happening. And, and the way we talked about it is the need to protect our shared playground. Yeah. So we brought in not, not people that, you know, we brought in athletes that cared about the planet and could be evangelicals for the the idea around protecting the planet, sustainability, making it rad, but 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 really making the message, keeping the message out front because it was personal to them. Mm -hmm. So every artist like Dave Kinsey, um, uh, Jeff Soto, Sylvia G, these are artists that were absolutely dedicated to you know a conversation about the planet. Um, Mike Bassett, Rob Kingwell, these are got people that that wanted to do more for the planet and saw Arbor as a place where they could partner their ethos with our ethos. And they helped rejuvenate the conversation and, and how we were talking about it. So it, it was it was about bringing in like minded people and and building a, a collective of people that did different things within the brand, but we're all on this same mission that was Arbor. Nice. And and then did you did you look at that and then expand out into different things like you know bringing in more apparel products or you know how did like like where did it go from from those sort of like early two thousands on on from there? So we um, we had start we were prototyping skates right away. You know our first mm -hmm. skateboards were Blam snowboards from our our own factory. You know our. our <laughs> Our factory that we was in Southern California was a disaster. I, I mean, going back a bit, we um, uh, we got to that first trade show and sold about a thousand boards year one, and we made the classic mistake of taking a big deposit from a Japanese distributor, um, spending all that money to ramp up our factory, thinking we could scale up, but we couldn't. And, we absolutely failed. And I had halfway through the production season, I had to pull the plug and go uh, and find a, a factory to work with. And I went down to San Diego to a, a little factory called Creed, a guy named Tom Tarrant, who I'd love to connect with one day. I, I basically lived down there and we made about 400 boards and got through that season. 
Um, and I, uh, it, it, it took me years. We ended up giving shares in the company to the Japanese distributor to pay them back for the boards that we couldn't deliver. I actually just bought them back a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, so we, we moved on to, uh, you know, partnering with factories and that was that was a really good thing at first we thought oh if we do that people are gonna steal what we do but in the end we found that they were a big part of the collective that they brought a lot to the table and helped us evolve mm -hmm. the brand um, unfortunately the factories consolidated as much as the brands and retail stores did and we chased production across the u.s and across canada and eventually into europe um so uh uh you know we we when so to bring this back to your question, when we were making those first boards ourselves, you can imagine how many blems, unsellable mistake boards that we made. And those boards, uh, a lot we couldn't throw away. It just wasn't in our nature to throw these beautiful Koa top snowboards away that had a blem. So we started cutting them into skate shapes. Um, at first, we just started riding these big, you know, bombing hills around our neighborhood. We'd put a, we'd go to, um, we'd go buy old tracker trucks and put a one by down the middle of them. And in the off season, we were bombing to Mesco Canyon on these big flexible snowboard skates, but we then started cutting them down into unique surfy shapes and trying to find a way to repurpose these, these blam snowboards. And they were fun and they were good for bombing Hills, but they weren't, they weren't great. Um, and we eventually started making sustainable, sustainably sourced maple skates. Uh, and prototype those and eventually launched, launched our skate program, I think in 97 or 98. Mm -hmm. um, we, were, uh, we were also the really early to adopt organic cotton. We started making a parallel of organic cotton. Uh, we were probably the first company in all of apparel to bring bamboo apparel into the marketplace. Uh, I was buying a ton of bamboo cores and, and bamboo top sheets uh, from this guy in San Francisco. And he threw me a bar towel. He said, what do you think that is? I said, it's it's a bar towel. And it had Carlsberg on it. He's like, dude, that's bamboo. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, that is that is a bamboo um, viscose spun into a fiber. And we're, we're a partner of mine is starting to make apparel. He's got the patent on it and starting to make apparel. Um, and we jumped on it. We started making bamboo t-shirts. We made a whole line of products out of out of bamboo, you know, our, our, our sort of brand extension philosophy is if you, you know, if you can do it between Venice and Mammoth on that road trip, it's Arbor, you know, that's the genesis of the brand. So, you know, rugged, comfortable, sustainable clothes that you'd want to go on a road trip trip in was what, what we wanted to build as we were developing our line clothes that you could skate in at, in Venice, you know, at work to the bars, you know, clothes you'd want to wear after snowboarding and clothes that you'd want to get in and, and, and drive to Mammoth in. And bamboo was the perfect fabric for that, you know, especially when our focus was sustainability. Yeah. There's nothing. There's no more woody plant that is more renewable and sustainable, two different things than bamboo. So, and, yeah, we and, brand. And, and was it was it picking up then sort of as the as those millennials kind of, I guess, got into the market and the whole sustainability thing was kind of like was it was it was becoming more you know so everything more appreciated should we say that you know instead of like now it's just where it's where it's the norm but you know we, there was like compared to the early days right as the new century got going we were kicking ass and and failing <laughs> i i <laughs> it's the funniest thing that you learn in in business that growth can actually absolutely kill you I did not have the financing in place to manage our growth. And I was robbing Peter to pay Paul every freaking season uh, and every little amount of profitability I could squeeze out of the business was going to build that additional product we sold over the previous year. So we were just, you know, and which wasn't enough. So we were just getting more into debt again. And, um, you know, I had just come through this huge consolidation in snowboarding and watched all these people go out of business because they had made financial decisions with, and frankly, decisions around control of their company um, that ended up really putting them in a position where they had to close their doors. 
And I was not about to bring in a venture capitalist or, you know, or a private equity company or some big angel investor that wanted control and wanted to tell me what Arbor was and wasn't and wanted to put the whole business on, you know, sort of a march towards profitability. Yeah. So I, I kind of expanded on the collective model and I partnered with uh, my supplier, my skateboard supplier at the time, uh, which was Sector 9. So this is about 2007. We'd been, they'd been making our skates since about 2000. And uh, we had just grown out of our warehouse and I um, was going, God, I'm going to have to spend a ton of money to expand what, what we need for our, our operations. And Steve Lake, um, who's the founder, one of the two founders of Sector 9, had just bought a building across the street, hugely expanded his factory to meet his needs. And just as I was going, shit, what are we going to do? He was going, shit, I bit off more than I can chew. And we had a conversation one day about what we what we both needed. And we decided to partner. Um, we, we had decided to create sort of a shared um, it's sort of not a, I mean, I guess you call it a joint venture. He handled all of the distribution of our skateboards, oversaw the production, um, logistics, credit, all the finance, um, oversaw sales. And I kept at Arbor in Venice, all them all oversaw the site of the marketing and the product development, the art development, the branding, um, and sort of leading the brand. And we kept it very separate. And he became our global exclusive distributor and my partner. And we, we did that until um, he left the business, I don't know, which was probably uh, 2015 maybe. And um, that was the key for us to get to the next stage. Instead of going out and convincing a bank or some money guy to, to help us, we partnered with other companies, privately held companies, run by people who snowboarded, who skated, who surfed, who could help add to the conversation at our table, who could bring knowledge and expertise to our table, help us make us big. Sector 9 made our skate program big and global and super competitive. And we got to stay small, close to our mission, on mission, close to our customer. We actually built a store inside our building where our warehouse used to be. Um, so close to our close to customer, close to, the, to snowboarding and skateboarding, um, and, and in charge of the creative process, we disconnected the creative process of mark, mark, you know, content creation, marketing, product development, art, branding from operations and all the finance and all the stresses involved with that. Yeah. We got better at what we did when it came to telling our story and keeping Arbor rad and fresh and moving forward. And, um, it worked, it worked so well that I then went out and did a partnership with a, com a company called Motion Sports um, on, for the snowboard side. And I have now done a, an, a, pro, a partnership uh, on the apparel side. And, and the, today, Arbor is this unique collection of like-minded people who uh, uh, are in, well, it's, three, it's really three partnerships around snowboards, skateboards, and soft goods. Mm -hmm. And Everybody works together on this brand that we all share. We all uh, share the responsibility, share the revenues, uh, and share a passion for what Arbor does. Uh, but each category is 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 a partnership with somebody who's a specialist in that partner in that product category. So today I'm partnered with Shiner globally uh, on our skateboard program, who you probably know. Mm -hmm. And they, the you know Charlie and his brother, are my, are my partners on everything we do. They run the global distribution. I run the development of the products and the development of the marketing and it works. And we've kept the wolves, wolves at bay and there, and we can, because of those bigger partners, we can stand toe to toe with anybody out there yet keep it small and real and authentic and on mission. Nice. And now, I mean, um, uh, just, just this past November was, was the yeah. 25th anniversary um yeah congratulations Thanks. on that and um you, you guys are about to re release a documentary um yeah. called crossing the grain uh which yeah. is coming out this winter right yeah you know we we got it, it we took a lot of punches in the early days again in the in the 90s and i think snowboarding and skateboarding thought we were soft 
you know, we were hippies. We were not cool. Um, and again, we didn't do much to help ourselves. And in and, and our outsider, being outsiders also led to a, a misunderstanding of small cues that helped us, you know, helped our, our ability to be relevant in those those markets at that time. And, you know, we kind of got quiet about sustainability because it for us, it was something we were had to do. It was personal. It was not marketing. It was something we believed in. And if it wasn't cool, we were just going to keep doing it. We put the information in there out there for anybody who wanted to digest it. And for those people who didn't, uh, we didn't hit them over the head with it. And we've gone nearly over for 25 years talking about it, but not really waving the flag. Um, because, you know, A, it was tough in the beginning and B, uh, when it did kind of rear its head in, in the going green days, um, it was such bullshit, it was such marketing and people were faking it, greenwashing the hell out of things that they were doing. And we were so turned off by that. We just stayed the course and didn't go, hey, look at us. You know, we've been doing this since 95. You know, we were the first brand in action sports founded to focus on sustainability. We were the first company to come out with natural materi materials as an alternative to man-made, more toxic materials. And um, I'm happy to say that today, what I'm seeing from both the snowboarding and skate world is really authentic. What, what Jones is doing, what Burton's doing, you know, people are so um, personally connected to the efforts they're making around the planet. And I think things have really changed forever. Um, I don't think action sports is ever going backwards in their commitment to protecting our shared playground. And I think it's time for us to kind of tell our story. And I, I think the best way to do it is humbly um, and laugh at ourselves, you know, come out there and, and talk about the free your soul video we did talk about, you know, this overplay on surf, you know, uh, just, just the, the, the failures, the falling down, you know, the goofy flower prints, the, just the mistakes we made along the way um, in that talk about resilience and what it takes mm -hmm. to, um, to stick to your guns. Um, and then through that humility, you know, look back and say, look, these are the things we accomplished over the years and, and let people know that, you know, we were the first to bring bioplastics and recycled steel edges and, you know, non forest wood products and um, recycled grit and biourethanes, natural biourethanes and bioplastics. Um, and, and humbly, you know, thank the people that helped the collective of people that helped us get there and helped us innovate around a, a need to protect the planet um, from the heart, hard work, often thankless and, um, you know, acknowledge the journey for 25 years um, to get to where we're blessed to be today. Uh, and then and remind ourselves of that as we, we, we steal ourselves for the next 25 years of innovating around the planet, sustainability, performance, craftsmanship, and all the things that make Arbor Arbor. Nice. And I mean, reflecting on those 25 years and, you know, the ups and downs and the challenges that you guys have had, uh, is there anything that you think that you, that you guys would have like now looking back with that you would have done differently and like any oh. advice that you can give? <laughs> there's probably there's really few things, but any advice that sort of uh. stick out in your head of like, okay, if we were going to do this, you know, would it be something like if you would have like partnered earlier or I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, our first collaboration with an athlete was with a guy in his early seventies who was a legendary big wave surfer, um, uh, Mickey Munoz, who surfed Waimea Bay uh, with Greg Knoll the first time. And I'm very fond of that, of what we did, but nobody got it. It was way ahead of time. And people talk about the bleeding edge that, you know, the, the cutting edge, the, the, somebody early on told me about the bleeding edge, which is ahead of the cutting edge. You know, the razor blade cuts a line um, and we were way out on that bleeding edge. And so many of the things we did were, were cool, but way, way too early. Um, and it took us a while and a lot of fortitude and a lot of stubbornness to, to get to the cutting edge of sustainability. And 
most people on the bleeding edge don't make it. And it was only because we're such pig heads that we were able to, to, to stick at it and get there. We made more mistakes. Uh, go, we, we, you know, we, we started distributing too er internationally too early. Um, we, we thought we knew what graphics should look like. We, it was, we, we thought we knew everything and we knew nothing. We knew about wood. Um, there's this great book, The E-Myth, and it talks about entrepreneurs. Um, they take one skill set and they start a business. Well, that business takes 12 skill sets to run. And uh, those other 11, you uh, if you don't have, you can't be successful. That's why so many small businesses go out. Of, go out. And we we had to learn those lessons the hard way. And along the way, we did some dumb shit, dumb graphics, dumb presentations of the brand. Um, the wrong partnerships, um, mistakes around finance, um, you know, m mistakes, you know, around. <laughs> so, but the question, I think your question is interesting because if I, if I went back, if I could go back and change that, we would not be here. Yeah. If I had made less mistakes, if I had been able to go out and raise money, if I had, we would have screwed everything up. We would have, we would have grown too fast and fallen just as fast. We wouldn't have learned that the cadence of a timeless brand is about slow growth, slow adoption, building long lasting relationships with your customers that, that are meaningful to, to their lifelong pursuit of skateboarding, snowboarding, and surfing. Um, not being in a rush to be a trend. Don't be a trend. Now, I would have, we would have done all those things and it's only the downs that allowed us to enjoy the ups and it's only the downs that taught us some of the hard lessons. So I wouldn't change a thing, um, but it was painful. It remains painful, uh, I, you know, right now having to relive a lot of it as we were building Crossing the Grain and, and, and telling this, this human story of, of uh, pride and ego and, um, uh, and failure that comes from it and having to humble yourself and learn from others and, and build a group of, of people you respect that can help you keep a brand growing and refreshing itself and renewing itself yet committed totally to its mission. Um, that is a, that is a hard thing to do, but I don't know how else you do it. I really don't know how else, um, that gets taught. I don't know if they can teach that at business school. Failure is the greatest, and these are almost, it's almost like metaphors, but failure really truly is the greatest teacher. And my job today, I think, is to continue to bring those lessons back around to our, our family and remind them um, of, of, of those things that, that we've learned and, um, and how to honor them as we go forward. So. That's good advice. And and now, like, obviously, I mean, with what happened this year and what's still happening with, with the pandemic, I mean, how, how has that impacted Arbor uh, across oh. as, as, as a company as a whole? Uh, I, it's weird. It, you know, we're in a pandemic, and it's been incredibly good for business. Um, it's hard to celebrate that. Uh, we, our skateboard sales have never been better. Our snowboard sales have never been better. Why? Because so many of the things that we do aren't allowed, aren't, aren't, don't happen anymore. You're not allowed to go to a restaurant, go to the bars. Kids aren't allowed to play team sports, at least here in the U.S. And a lot of people are turning to outdoor activities that are naturally socially distant, both just to have fun, but also to stay sane. You know, there, again, there's nothing more, uh, keep your mind healthy than making turns. And so people have turned in great numbers to snowboarding and skateboarding and the demographic shift and the participation explosion is really cool to watch. People are coming back to skateboarding in huge numbers. People who haven't been on a skate in 10 years or skating again. They're bringing their kids in. They're getting skates together. More women are skateboarding today than I have ever seen in my life. Um, and the, the and the participation because it's it's happening this this a discovery is happening into these difficult times is so meaningful for these these people who are learning to skate and snowboard are coming back to it because they're you know it's it's pretty depressing out there and they're 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 having these amazing experiences um, as an alternative to what's happening with the stay at home orders and the shutdowns 
And I think we're building part, huge participation that's going to really last for a long time. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. I think it's good. I don't know about the pandemic. You know, I'm 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 one of those people that believes in the environment. I, the you know viruses are part of the environment. Um, this one, 99.7% of the people who get it survive. Um, we need to have some fortitude and, and learn to live with it. I'm not 100% sure that the vaccine is going to be the silver bullet. Um, and uh, I believe that that us humans are tougher than we remember. And I think we're going to get through this and we're going to learn to live with this. Um, and we're going to learn to, 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 to manage it better and better. Hopefully the vaccine helps. It will help at some level and, um, and we'll get through this. I, I think we will. And I think we're going to get through this better people uh, that are counting our blessings and appreciating the life and the world around us more than we ever have before and our friends and our families and the things we love to do. Cause it's nothing, there's nothing like having the government take away some of the things that you like to do to appreciate those things um, at a new, very deep, very high level. And that's certainly happening. So well, I think the future is really bright. And, and what are you, what are you guys focusing on? You know, what, what, what's Arbor's goals uh, sort of coming, coming out of this and sort of lo looking into next year and hopefully in the next 25 years. My my goals for the next twenty five years is to make sure this company is is stays sticks to its culture, stays on track, that it is um, that it continues to be a culture of people that listens to each other and finds the center and finds the answers through bringing our different ideas together, uh, and we continue to innovate and Im improve and and stay fresh through that dialogue and that conversation, that upside down pyramid, that idea of all being at the table together. Um, 25 years from now, I, I most likely won't be, uh, won't be here or won't be, hopefully I'm retired somewhere, um, snowboarding every day. Um, but so I hope the company's culture stays true and continues to rejuvenate the brand that way. Um, I hope that we, you know, one of the things I love about our skateboards is you can take the trucks off when the skateboard's done, you can take the trucks off and throw them in the recycling bin. Um, we need to do work on the wheels, but the deck, you can cut that deck up. Uh, the wood glue, the, the, the sustainable, sustainably sourced maple, you can bury it in your backyard and it will biodegrade. I would love in 25 years to be able to look back to the point where we were able to make a snowboard that when you're done riding it for 10 years, because it's built to last, or the, the last person that you, you know, you, you give it to somebody who's learning to snowboard and help them fall in love with the sport and they give it to somebody else. So whenever that board's life is over, that it can be cut up and put in, put in a hole and biodegrade. You know, this idea of um, compostable products where you have to send them back somewhere and double its carbon footprint, bathe it in a toxic chemical so that it falls apart and its individual components can be recycled, for me is bullshit. Um, the, you, know, you want to be able to um, put something back into the environment safely locally. Um, I hope we've figured that out. Um, I hope snowboarding has grown so much that the that brands can make their products locally, that our European boards are made in Europe, that our North American boards are made in, in, in North America, and that our Asian boards are made in Asia. Um, right now, it's it's impossible. Nobody's big enough to do that. Um, so we make these single source boards and distribute them around the world. So it doesn't matter where you're making your boards on the planet, they're moving around the globe. Um, and, and the footprint of that is, is real. Um, but they're moving around the globe to get to their, their customer. Um, uh, a local production would be something which, which requires growth in the industry. And, and I look for, I hope in 25 years we're there. Um, and I think, I hope our, our give back program, we were the first action sports brand to formally commit to giving back a portion of sales to the restoration mm -hmm. of the environment. We've been planting trees in Hawaii for 25 years. Um, I hope in 25 years, I'm able to take my grandkids to a fully restored, protected forest that started as a cow pasture and is now a thriving, uh, fully working, biodiverse, restored piece of the environment and show them what the company did uh, by committing to this give back to the planet. 
Um, we give back in Hawaii because you know, Hawaiians invented surfing uh, as much as a thousand years ago on boards made from Hawaiian koa. Um, so if you surf sidewalks, if you surf swell, if you surf mountains, or surf snow, um, the Hawaiians really should get an odd of gratitude because they got us sliding sideways in the first place. And that ancient sport led to the modern sport of surfing that inspired us to surf sidewalks and eventually go up and surf mountains. Um, so it's a great place for us to give back to the planet, to give back to the people and the culture that gave us um, the, the, you know, this, the, this love of surfing different parts of the planet. Um, and it's also a really good carbon offset because when you plant a tropical hardwood, when it dies and rots, it wet rots and mulches and, and other plants uh, grow on top of it, sink their roots into it and pull the carbon out of it, re-sequestering it. So in a healthy tropical environment, carbon, when you plant trees, that carbon is re-sequestered every successive generation of plant life. Plant life. So the, the sequestration is for the life of the forest. When you plant non-tropical woods, softwoods or hardwoods, when they die, they fall over in a more dry environment and they dry rot, releasing their gases back to the planet. So the sequestration is only for the life of the tree. So I, I hope that in 25 years, uh, we are, we've really continued to make this commitment to, you know, in our case, acting locally, that's the only tropical forest we have in the United States um, and have really left a very meaningful mark on uh, you know the the cultural and environmental um, gem that is the koa force of hawaii and have really expanded our efforts in all sorts of directions and have, have really changed the surface of of that part of the world yeah. that's awesome cool yeah. and, and what's the what's the best way of people to to follow what you're up to and to to see you know everything that the arbor's doing so our website's arborcollective.com. Um, we have a, a different uh, Instagram handles, uh, Arbor Skateboards, um, Arbor Snowboards, Arbor Collective is sort of the catch-all. Um, and I'm Arbor underscore BC. And um, we're always doing cool stuff and making good content and just talking about what we do and, and uh, what we believe in and what the ethos of the brand is and, and uh, letting people meet that the range of people that make the Arbor Collective what it is. Nice. Cool. Thanks, Bob. It's been, it's been amazing hearing, hearing the story and, you know, how, how it all began and, you know, the, the, all the, all, all the changes along the way. Right. And yeah, yeah. I'm like, like really looking forward to the, when the, when the film comes out and. Thanks, bud. Yeah. So yeah, Crossing the Brain will be out this winter. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> it's a, uh, um, yeah, laugh at yourself. It's it's the key. So we're gonna do a lot of that, and we're gonna have a lot of fun, and we're gonna tell some stories. Nice. Thanks, man. All right. Cheers, Bob. Cheers.